Hi, I'm Lisa Weiland with the Wabash Valley Astronomical Society. This video is going to be about catadioptric telescopes. I'll assume you've already watched our telescope fair overview and accessories videos for prerequisite information and terminology we'll be using. Catadioptric telescopes use lenses and mirrors working together to collect an image. They are descended from a class of reflector telescopes known as Cassegrains. More about those in a bit. Catadioptric Cassegrains explored using mirrors of all the various curved geometric figures that contain focus points, parabolas, hyperbolas, and ellipses. Finally, telescope designers went back to the idea of using cheaper to make spherical primary mirrors. First, let's discuss some terminology you'll hear in this video. Spherical aberration. Spherical mirrors suffer from spherical aberration, with light reflecting from a spherical surface, focusing in a succession of focal points that become closer to the mirror as the incident light strikes the mirror farther away from its center. There is no single focal plane, so there is no single image to focus on. But this problem, like bad eyesight, can be cured with a corrector lens, also referred to as a corrector plate. Here is a cutaway view of a typical catadioptric telescope. In this video, we'll be using the terms corrector plate, secondary mirror, and primary mirror. This picture demonstrates what is meant when these terms are used. The red lines in this picture show the path that light travels inside the telescope. Note that in most catadioptric scopes, the primary mirror has a hole through its center, making it appear cut in half in these cutaway views. Also, different types of catadioptric scopes have different corrector plate shapes, but corrector plates are placed at the aperture end that is the sky end of the telescope in the most popular models. In this video, we'll also use the term diffraction. Diffraction refers to the effects that show up in a photograph or visually when waves of light bend around an obstacle or aperture. The veins or struts, commonly referred to as the spider that supports the secondary mirror in some reflectors, constitute a set of edges that light waves must skim by on the way to the telescope's mirror. As they do so, they are deflected a bit. This deflection is called diffraction. Each vein produces a diffraction line that is perpendicular to the boundary of the vein. So, a spider having two straight veins, which are oriented at a right angle to each other, like the third image from the left, will produce two intersecting diffraction lines having the same perpendicular orientation to each other, resulting in four diffraction spikes. A three-vein spider with the veins set 120 degrees apart, like the rightmost image, will produce a star image having three intersecting diffraction lines for a total of six spikes. Here's an example of a four-spike diffraction in a star field photo that could occur with a four-vein spider or secondary mirror support telescope. See how every star seems to have an X of spiked light in the center of it? That's the effect of diffraction. An advantage of catadioptric scopes with corrector plates is that they are free of these diffraction spikes on star images. So now let's look at the components of the two most popular catadioptric telescopes, the Schmidt Cassegrain, or SCT, and the Maxitov Cassegrain, also known as a MAC or MCT. The Schmidt Cass scope is defined by the relatively thin Schmidt corrector plate at the front of the telescope. This plate does three things. One, it directs light coming into the scope to fall on the mirror in such a way that it will come to a spherical aberration free focus. Two, it holds the convex secondary mirror in a diffraction spike free way. And three, it seals the telescope closed. 
The primary mirror actually has a spherical shape and a hole right in the center of it for light from the secondary to pass through. A tube runs through this hole and the telescope is focused by moving the primary back and forth along this optical axis or center line of the scope along the tube. The secondary mirror has a nearly spherical shape but also corrects for any other spherical aberrations that might be present in individual telescopes. A diagonal is often, but not necessarily used with catadioptric scopes. It's optional. The Maxitov Cassegrain, or MAC or MCT telescope, has a meniscus lens. That is, a thick lens that's spherically curved both at its outer and inner surfaces for a corrector plate. The curves at the front and back of the lens do not have to be the same. Instead of an actual secondary mirror, there is an illuminized spot on the optical axis at the back of the meniscus lens. Since this spot does not need any sort of holder or support, a max spot can be smaller than the actual secondary mirror, like an SCT has. The smaller obstruction means increased performance when taking photos. The correcting meniscus lens on a MAC produces spherical aberration in amount equal but opposite to that of the primary mirror. In every other way, the MAC components are the same as the Schmidt cast components. Now let's look at the light path of a catadioptric scope. Since the light path works basically the same for all catadioptrics and cassegrains, we're just using the diagram for a Schmidt cast to demonstrate. Light enters the scope at the front, bounces off the primary, to then strike a secondary mirror. This secondary then folds the light again to cause the light cone to eventually come out the back through a hole in the primary mirror. All of these folds in the light path count in measuring the focal length, and the convex nature of the secondary gives the focal length a big boost. Here are cutaway views of a Schmidt cast scope and a Mac scope for comparison. The curves demonstrated in the Schmidt corrector plate are exaggerated in this diagram, so you can get a sense of its actual shape. To look at one, you'd just perceive it as being flat. The much thicker corrector plate in the MAC scope becomes a problem for larger apertures not only because of how heavy it is, but also because of the way it retains heat because of that thickness. It significantly increases the amount of time required for the telescope to cool down and come to thermal equilibrium so that it can provide the sort of views it should be capable of. Still. With the amount of focal length catadioptrics can provide, very large apertures aren't really necessary. You might think a Schmidt cast or a Mac should have a focal length that's just twice as long as the length of its tube since light travels the length of the tube twice. However, these telescopes actually have focal lengths about five times longer than their tube lengths five to seven times longer in max. Their convex secondaries magnify the focal length, making the scope act much longer than it physically is. The primary mirror of an SCT usually has a focal length of only about twice its diameter. For example, an eight inch Schmidt cast would have a primary mirror which focuses light to a point 16 inches in front of the mirror. But, after hitting the primary, light hits the convex secondary first. And light is reflected off the secondary at a sharper angle. If you trace this light cone back to where it reaches the full width of the telescope's aperture, you can see how long the effective focal length is. Most Schmidt cast scopes have secondary mirrors that boost the overall focal length by a factor of five times. In this example, the eight inch primary with the 16 inch focal length, the effective focal length would be 16 times five, which equals 80 inches. 
That's five times the primary mirror's focal length and 10 times the diameter of the primary mirror. That's an enormous focal length in a scope only about 16 inches long. In a Maxitov Cassegrain scope, the only difference is that the convex secondary is a convex aluminized spot. A seven inch Mac would have a primary mirror focal length of about 21 inches, three times its diameter, focusing light to a point 21 inches in front of the mirror. The spot secondary is convex in shape and also reflects light to a sharper angle. Again, if you trace this light cone back to where it reaches the full width of the primary's aperture, you again have a focal length boost factor of around five times. That makes the effective focal length of the max scope 105 inches, which is 15 times the diameter of the primary mirror in a telescope only about 21 inches long. The Schmidt casts and the Maxitov casts are both descendants of the original Cassegrain telescope design, which was itself a descendant of the Gregorian telescope design, an idea which was floated by James Gregory in 1663. In the Gregorian scope, light enters through the tube through the front at point A. It then hits the concave parabolic primary mirror, B, and then continues to the concave elliptical secondary mirror, D, where it is then reflected out through a hole in the primary to a focus at the back of the tube. Note that the secondary mirror, D, is beyond the focal point, C, of the primary mirror in this design. Because of this, the image produced when passed through an eyepiece is upright. In the April 1672 issue of the Journal des Savants, a French science publication, a new idea for a telescope design appeared attributed to a Monsieur Cassegrain. The previous month, at the behest of Christian Huygens, the same journal had published Newton's reflecting telescope design which actually ended up employing a spherical primary mirror whose light was reflected off of a flat secondary out through a hole in the side of the tube. The Cassegrain design called for a concave parabolic primary with a convex hyperbolic secondary that sent its light back through a hole in the middle of the primary to come to a focus behind it. The tube was open, and like Newton's design, the telescope was a pure reflector. No lenses were involved. Cassegrain was a French Catholic priest and instrument maker who taught science at what amounted to the high school level. Newton and Huygens, and James Gregory for that matter, were all fellows of the Royal Society, England's National Science Academy. Cassegrain's idea was excoriated by both Isaac Newton and Christian Huygens. Newton said, the advantages of this design are none, but the disadvantage is so great and unavoidable that I fear it will never be put in practice with good effect. At the time, casting and forming a parabolic mirror from the metal alloys available had proved nearly impossible, let alone a hyperbolic mirror for a secondary. But even so, a prototype of Gregory's design was built in 1673, and poor Cassegrain's idea was killed by the experts of his day. Cassegrain's first name wasn't even known until 1997. It was eventually presumed to be Laurent, but even today, no one has 100% certainty of that. But what is certain is that while Cassegrain himself never saw his design come to fruition, in modern times, his design and its descendants are all over the place. The classical Cassegrain configuration, with its focal length boosting convex secondary that shoots light out through a hole in the primary, has had about 350 years to evolve now. Two of mind-boggling amounts of other combinations of primary mirrors and secondary mirrors are the Ritchie Crichton and the Dahl Kirkham. 
These other designs came about as a means of correcting for various optical aberrations that show up in photographs or for decreasing the cost of making the telescope. While experimenting with different combinations of focused curves led to important design developments, an equally important modification came about in the form of adding a third flat mirror. In the late 1800s, an amateur astronomer, retired Scottish mechanical engineer James Naismith, came up with a modification to the Cassegrain telescope that left the primary mirror intact and added a third flat mirror to the system to shoot light out through a hole in the altitude axis. Many large professional telescopes still in use today use this modification because it allows the attachment of heavy or sensitive equipment to a part of the telescope where the balance of the system will not be changed as the telescope tracks an object. Nor will the tracking drive motors bear the weight of cameras and so forth. This photo shows two entire laboratories built along the altitude axis of the GTC that are supported by two large Naismith platforms. Those tubes that look like cannons sticking out of the front are supports for other lighter sensors which can be placed on these other openings along that same Naismith plane. They can be easily accessed by turning the tertiary mirror. The GTC itself is a classic Cassegrain design with a parabolic primary and a hyperbolic secondary. The multi-mirror telescope near Tucson is a chorus of classic Cassegrains. The DLR and NASA's SOFIA Observatory is a classic Cassegrain. The WM Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea are the Ritchie Crichton variant with a pair of hyperbolic mirrors. The Hubble Space Telescope is also a Ritchie Crichton. By 1969, the Cassegrain had evolved into a nested version of its original self in the Paul Baker design. Light strikes the perforated primary to continue to the large convex secondary to be reflected from a third mirror, a concave spherical, and then arrive at a focus point where a camera or other sensor would be placed. But there is nothing to say that a primary has to have a large perforation or be a paraboloid. Nor does a secondary have to be large or spherical. Nor does a tertiary have to be spherical or positioned before the secondary comes to a focus. A camera or sensor can be placed where the tertiary comes to a focus or a flat mirror can be placed just before that focus to direct the image elsewhere. In 1972, Dietrich Korsch devised this three-mirror anastigmat in a design that avoids the major problems of astrophotography, spherical aberration, coma, astigmatism, and field curvature. More about astrophoto problems in a bit. This Korsh FAA-2 telescope design is the one being used for the James Webb Space Telescope. Instead of just changing mirror types, Cassegrains become catadioptrics with the addition of lenses into the equation. Most catadioptric designs have a full aperture cover and corrector plater lens, but it wasn't long before scope designers realized they could put small correcting lenses in front of the secondary mirror instead. Some Maxitov variants, the Argonov and the Klevsov, have this. This list is a very small sampling of Cassegrain-based telescope designs that can be found. The Argonov cast and the Klebsov cast both use what are known as sub-aperture lenses to correct the spherical aberration from their spherical mirrors. In this way, both telescope designs avoid the heavy corrector plate of the Maxitov. Telescope designers found that correcting lenses can be placed anywhere in the light path 
which led to an explosion of telescope designs. The human brain compensates for a lot of optical flaws that occur in the fields of telescopes, so if you're interested only in visual observing, a schmidt cassegrain or MCT scope should suffice for your needs. But if you're interested in astrophotography, you'll find that the flat camera sensor, be it film or charge coupled device, is very unforgiving, causing various aberrations across the field. If you just want to take the occasional astrophoto and don't really mind some imperfections in the field, then again, a standard Schmidt cast or Mac should suit you fine. However, if you are interested in serious astrophotography, you may want to consider obtaining an astrograph, a telescope whose primary function is astrophotography by design. Before we talk about astrograph designs, let's first take a quick look at some common aberrations that astrophotographers have to deal with. Aberrations come in two main classes, chromatic and monochromatic. Chromatic aberrations arise from imperfections in the way a lens or mirror disperses different colors of light. Monochromatic aberrations arise from problems in what happens to any single color of light and include spherical, which we mentioned in our terminology section at the beginning of this video, comatic, usually just called coma, astigmatism, of which there are two types, tangential and sagittal, and field curvature. Vignetting is another problem that comes up. Diffraction can be a problem too, as we saw earlier. First, we'll look at chromatic aberration, which is also covered in our refractors video. Light passing through a lens is bent to reach a focus point, but each wavelength of light, or color of light, is bent by a slightly different amount. So red, green, and blue wavelengths don't focus at the exact same position. This can give an image false color, known as chromatic aberration. Here is a graphic example of chromatic aberration. This photo exhibits chromatic aberration. Let's take a close-up look at the section of sky shown in the white box. The blue and purple color fringing to the upper right of every star in this photo is certainly apparent. If you look closely at the brighter stars, you will also see some green color fringing to the lower left of those. This is chromatic aberration. Lower to mid-range refractors are likely to have this aberration, but any telescope with lenses involved might demonstrate it. Such aberration is unlikely to be something the telescope's owner can fix. Now we'll look at monochromatic aberrations. Since spherical aberration was covered back in our terminology section, We'll move right along to comatic aberration, usually just referred to as coma. As shown in this graphic, coma gives stars a comet-like shape. This is more apparent on stars at the edge of your photographic field. External coma, with the bright centers pointing toward the center of the photograph and the tails pointing away, is the most common type although the reverse can occur. Internal coma has tails pointing toward the center. Coma is inherent in reflecting telescopes and increases with distance from the mirror's center. This photograph demonstrates coma. Let's take a close-up look at the area in the white box. See the triangular looking shape of the three brightest stars? And they kind of have a bright streaky center to the upper right on all of them? That's coma. This example, in fact, shows internal coma with the comedy tails pointing toward the photo center. Special lenses called coma correctors can be purchased. There are different ones for different telescope types. Coma correctors also increase the back focus, which is helpful to people doing photography with Newtonian reflectors. 
Now we'll look at astigmatism. Astigmatism comes in two types, tangential and sagittal. Astigmatism causes stars at the edge of the frame to appear to stretch into a line. On these graphic diagrams, note the position of the white triangle. Imagine this triangle as pointing to the center of the photo. In tangential astigmatism, the stars get spread into lines that seem to radiate from the center of the image. In sagittal astigmatism, the stars get spread into lines that look as if they're being rotated about the center of the image. Here's an example of tangential astigmatism. Stars at the very center of the field look okay, but out at the sides, it looks like you're making the jump to hyperspace. The stars are spread out into lines that seem to radiate from the center of the image. Now we'll focus on sagittal astigmatism, where the stars look like they're rotating about the center of the image. This photo has been cropped to remove most of its sagittal astigmatism, but some still remains and is particularly noticeable on the photo's left side. You can see that the stars in the upper left and lower left corners look like they've been rotated about the center of the field. You can even see it in a few stars of the center left and even way out at the edge of the lower right corner. Let's take a close-up look at the stars in the white box. In the close-up, the stretching of the stars into lines is obvious. In the large view, you can see that they look rotated about the center of the photo. Astigmatism is not something the telescope owner can easily fix. Now we'll look at field curvature, also known as Petzval curvature. Curved surfaces, like lenses and mirrors, result in a curved focal plane. That is, the plane where the image comes to a focus. Unfortunately, the sensor of most cameras is flat. So with a curved image, focus across the sensor's field is varied, causing an image that looks in focus at the center and out of focus everywhere else. Here are two images of the Andromeda Galaxy M31. The one on the left has no field curvature, but the one on the right does demonstrate the effects of field curvature. To see it, let's look at the corners of each photo. Just looked at broadly, you can see that the stars in the corners of the photos with field curvature don't look like points, but instead look like stretched dots. To get a more close-up comparison, we first outline the margins of each corner. The corner group on the left goes with the no curvature image, also on the left, while the corner group on the right goes with the field curvature image on the right. In this way, we can compare the top left corner of one picture to the top left corner of the other, and so on. So that we can compare exact star groups, we'll mark off regions that match for each corner with blue boxes. Here, blue boxes surround areas of the same region for each photograph's corner. The no curvature corner group to the left corresponds to the field curvature corner group on the right. Looking at corresponding areas from the top left corners from both images, we can see the difference in the five star chain to the left and the two bright stars to the right. Without field curvature, the stars appear as dots. With field curvature, we have stretched dots. Comparing regions from the top right corners of both photos, you can again see the difference in stars without field curvature and the stars with field curvature. Here are star groupings from the bottom left corners of the images. Finally, 
Here are star groups from the lower right corners of the two images. In the original photos, stars at the center of the field are in focus, but as you move out towards the edge, field curvature causes stars to look like stretched dots instead of points of light. Here's a civilian example of field curvature. The young woman in the center of the photo is in focus, but look at the railing right behind her and the lights on it. Look at the lights reflecting off the water in the background. Everything else in this photo is out of focus. In this case, the effect was the result of depth of field adjustment of the lens stops to make sure this happened. While this effect can be great for pictures of things you want to highlight, it can be a disaster for astrophotos. Field curvature can be cured with the purchase of a field flattener. There are two types of these. One type just corrects field curvature, the other does that and reduces the apparent focal length as well. So you have a choice. Now we'll look at another problem, vignetting. Vignetting is where the edge of the frame appears darker than the center. This is common in catadioptric scopes like Schmidt Cass's and Max because they require a baffle tube to prevent light from the front of the scope falling directly onto the focal plane before reflection from the primary mirror, which can cause vignetting. But this problem is common in any low F number fast system, so Richie Crichtons are prone to it too. Here's a civilian version of vignetting. See how the happy couple appears to be in a halo of light at the center? Well, the brightness at the edges falls off. That's vignetting. Vignetting can be dealt with through calibration with flat frames during post-processing. But just like it can be used as a highlighting effect in wedding photos, it can also be used as a highlighting effect in astrophotos if you like. It's all a matter of taste. It is possible and common to have more than one type of aberration occurring at once. Or you can have star smudging due to guiding errors or other photographer-based errors. This makes diagnosing problems in astrophotos hard. Now let's look at a few astrograph designs. There are many to choose from. This is not an exhaustive list, but we're trying to focus in on a few designs that have price tags closer to the reach of amateur astrophotographers. All astrographs seek or sought to eliminate all major optical aberrations. The Ritchie Crichton is on the list. Richie Crichtons use a pair of hyperbolic mirrors to collect an image that then comes to a focus behind their primary mirrors. There are those who would wonder why they've been included with the astrographs since they suffer from astigmatism and field curvature, but they were developed to have no coma or spherical aberration over a wide field, which is why they were included. You can get Ritchie Crichtons that have corrective lenses for these problems. One type uses a pair of lenses, that's one is plano convex and the other plano concave, to correct field curvature and astigmatism without introducing chromatic aberration. A second type, which produces results that are nearly as good, uses a pair of meniscus lenses to correct the problems. The Dahl Kirkham uses an elliptical primary in combination with spherical secondary. Due to these mirror choices, the Dahl Kirkham is the easiest and therefore cheapest to make all reflecting two mirror telescope system. But it suffers badly with increasing coma with decreasing focal length, as well as field curvature and astigmatism. Fortunately, two element lens corrected doll kirkhams are available, as are three element imaging doll kirkhams as well. The three element version corrects for chromatic aberration introduced by some of the other two lens systems. 
Dahl Kirkham's can be corrected in many different ways. Here are four. You can see that the different lens sets get placed at different points along the light path. The Celestron Edge HD, like a typical Schmidt cast, uses a spherical primary and secondary with a Schmidt corrector plate at the front. But in the light path, they have included extra low dispersion glass lenses to correct for coma and field curvature. Without needing a veined support for the secondary mirror, they're also diffraction spike free as well. Meade's ACF telescopes use a spherical primary with a hyperbolic secondary with an optical corrector over the front that makes the primary mirror look like it's a hyperbolic mirror as seen by the secondary. In this way, coma is eliminated and the telescope mimics a Ritchie Crichton. Their images would also be diffraction spike free. The Rho Ackerman Schmidt is a pure prime focus astrograph. It doesn't even have a place for an eyepiece. It uses a spherical primary mirror along with a four element corrective lens group instead of a secondary mirror. They are not cheap but price-wise are still within the reach of your average serious amateur astrophotographer. The Harmer Wynn uses a parabolic primary mirror with a spherical secondary and sub-aperture correcting lenses in the light path. There are both two and three lens corrector designs. The lenses are made of extra low dispersion glass. These telescopes are very expensive. If you are interested in astrophotography, whether you should get an astrograph depends on personal taste and how much time and money you have for the hobby. Your decision should be based on how much perfection you want and how much perfection you can afford, keeping in mind that total perfection is never possible. If you're interested in a catadioptric telescope, astrograph, or any other astronomy equipment before you pull out your credit card, look for discussions of the product on this forum. Also, consult with your local astronomy club. Catadioptric telescopes are not perfect. Their incredible focal lengths make their fields of view narrow. They have less sharp contrast of the moon and planets as compared to refractors and cost two times as much as new Newtonian reflectors for the same aperture. Also, the ones that have actual secondary mirrors sometimes need alignment, a tough procedure in some of the models with exotic mirror combinations. That said, they are compact, portable, versatile, have very little chromatic aberration, and large aperture when compared to refractors. They're best for the moon, planets, double or multiple stars, but still give good views, although narrower ones, of deep sky objects. A good catadioptric telescope can give you a lifetime of enjoyment, observing many fascinating objects in the sky. If you have additional questions about telescopes or anything related to space and astronomy, please contact us through our website or by email.